it's all pre-taped. Oh, I'm Diane Kresh, director for Arlington Public Library and the host of Live from Diane's Living Room. We're not live, but we are local. And we're talking to people in our community who make Arlington the community that it is. So today we're joined by two people from AFAC. And I'm welcoming Lily Duran. Is that any relation to Duran Duran? No. <laughs> I had to. That's my, that's my musical era many, many decades ago. And Sarah Kate Hawkins, who is a volunteer with, uh, with AFAC. So let's start with a, a simple definition. What is AFAC and what does it do for the community of Arlington? Yeah, so AFAC is the Arlington Food Assistance Center. Um, we've been around for about 32 years, I think, from 88. Um, and we are kind of a unique organization in that we function both as a food pantry and also as a food bank. Um, and the distinction would be that food banks often tend to be larger, more regional organization that acquires food and then distributes it to food pantries, whereas the food pantry is doing the direct um, distribution of food to the people interacting with the public who's coming to get the service. So we do both. We have um, our headquarters is in the Sherlington area off of Four Mile Run. We have six days where we, of the week that we do food distributions here. Um, and then we partner with a lot of other local organizations like uh, affordable housing communities and the county's community outreach program. So then we can do food pantries throughout the community wherever you know there's a concentration of people who needs it. So we are providing free, nutritious, supplemental groceries to anybody who lives in Arlington who just can't afford you know, to buy their own groceries. Um, a lot of those folks are, some of those folks are unemployed. A lot of folks are underemployed where they're working, but they're just not making enough. They're making minimum wage or they can't get full-time hours. Um, so we really step in and, and help folks kind of stay afloat and then hopefully, you know, thrive, get out of the cycle of, of food insecurity. So when you say supplemental, supplemental, that's intended to be in addition to whatever they might be able to be spending on food. And is it weekly, a weekly distribution for each person or how does it actually work? Yeah, so we do a once a week model um, and we do the choice model, which I'll explain. So um, a lot of food pantries, some food pantries might do like once a month or a certain number of times a year. Um, our goal is to really be a sustainable resource for people. So our goal is to be once a week. Families can come in, they get their groceries one time every week. It might not be every single item of food that the family needs for the whole week for their whole family. But we do, um, you know, take into consideration that some families are larger than others. So a large family gets more food than a smaller family might or an individual might. Um, and, you know, we, we do our best to provide choice. So we use the choice model where we put foods on display, um, foods that we get donated and foods that we purchase. Um, and then people can choose which foods that they want. Now, right. you don't have every variety of almond milk and soy milk and rice milk and all of these things that, you know, we wish we could provide. Those are essential. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, if somebody has a dietary restriction that we, we might not be able to meet, we're hoping that we can, you know, with the food that we're providing, it's supplemental, that that can save them some money in their budget so that they can buy some of those more specialty items. Okay, so let's play, I'm a pescatarian. So how could I make use of... AFAC, the food distribution, like what would be the choices available to me? So we do have fish actually. Um, oh, wow. We purchase okay. about 60% of the food that we give out, I believe. Um, and so that includes things like milk, um, eggs, fish, chicken, ground beef, hot dogs, um, fruits and vegetables. So, you know, okay, you don't eat beef, no problem. You've got other choices there. You can okay. choose fish, you can choose other things. And I, I'd like to add to that in that we now have really gotten familiar with our clients. So for instance, the, the pasta section, we now have a, a bin where we put gluten-free pasta, uh, meatless beans that are canned. Um, what I try to do in the miscellaneous is I try to set aside the organic or the almond milk um, and or uh, a grouping of vegetables. So like yesterday, um, 
half the afternoon, we all had just meat, no plant base, just all meat. But what I had done is I had put two crates away of fresh vegetables. So when people came up and said, oh, I don't eat meat, I was able to offer them vegetables. And that's kind of, for me, getting to know our clients and to realize, oh, th this is what they need, or if they have a peanut allergy, trying to help them be able to feed their themselves and their family. Wow, that's terrific. And is that maybe a service that would be unique to what AFAC provides because you you actually get to know your customers and the people who come in week after week? For myself and my husband, I yes, I, I think that okay. when we made a when we made a decision to make a commitment to AFAC, we decided to give three days a week working both shifts. Okay. And and realize that there are there are just there's a cer certain amount of people who do come on Tuesday only Tuesday that's their day to catch the bus or get a ride. Okay. And so yes, we've gotten to know a lot and and a lot by by first name. Wow. Which is which is a lovely uh, gift. So it's almost it's it's functioning uh, both as a deterrent to food insecurity, but it's also kind of a community builder because. Mm -hmm. You have a body of volunteers uh, who presumably volunteer, as you do, uh, Sarah Kate and your husband, multiple times per week. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a, a chance for people to get to know one another so that they don't feel isolated and alone, like, oh, I'm going through this on my own. Um, how did you guys, let's start with you, Lily. How did you get involved in the food biz? So. Um... I'm not from this area originally. I came down here from New York. Um, I actually came here for graduate school and I was studying Latin American studies um, and Spanish. And so I think I, you know, ended up wanting to work kind of hyper locally and wanted to support, you know, what's largely a Latinx community mm -hmm. um, in this area that's utilizing these services. Um, and so when I came on at AFAC, I was, which was like 2012, maybe, I think I was one of the few Spanish speakers on staff. And so mm -hmm. I really was able to communicate with so many of our clients that way, um, you know, and, and, and support them and bring a little bit of that knowledge and, and cultural competence into some of our practices, because we want, you know, it's not just translating the language, but it's being able to serve um, folks in a way that's kind of, uh, you know, easy to understand and, and sure. you know, providing the foods that people really want to eat things that are familiar to them. You know, we've got a diverse uh, clientele that we serve. Um, and so we need to make sure that if we're serving, you know, a whole bunch of butternut squash, well, not everybody who we serve even knows what that is, how to cut it open, how to prepare oh, sure. it. Um, so I think, you know, we, we try to think pretty hard about that. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. So Sarah Kate, how were you drawn to, uh, to volunteer at AFAC? Well, I'm like Lily, I'm not from this area. Um, actually, uh, my husband, Jeff and I, uh, were serving as Peace Corps volunteers in Fiji on a very oh. remote island uh, when the pandemic hit and when Peace Corps decided that they needed to bring back all the volunteers, uh, we really didn't have lack of communication and internet. We didn't realize what we were coming back to. Uh, so a good friend of ours who lives here in Arlington offered his second home to us. Um, and after we finish our quarantine, we start, you know, researching and I'm a retired psychologist and, and Jeff's an educator, nothing was clicking. And, uh, somebody said, uh, one of the neighborhoods here, friends said something about Arlington affect and mm -hmm. we reached out and, uh, initially, uh, they were like saying, well, we're only doing it this way and this way. So we sent a letter from Peace Corps about uh, our, you know, as, as volunteers and seeking. Um, and they said, okay, sign up. And from there, that was oh, a year ago. <laughs> yeah. um, a year ago. And, and we just fell in love. And like Lily said, besides, it is a community. Mm -hmm. um, when we go in there, we we talk and laugh with with people that work and volunteer. Um, we've gotten to know. I, I had Tamil just brought me this wonderful Middle Eastern dish the other morning for to share with me. So, and 
and we've been really surprised by Arlington and the people. So, mm -hmm. and we, we anticipate being here for another year. So it's a great place for us to spend our time. And I imagine some of what you're doing, um, getting to know people from other cultures is, is kind of analogous to what you were doing when you were in the Peace Corps, right? Yes. You're not in Fiji. Arlington is certainly not Fiji, <laughs> but, but it is diverse. Lots of different people yes. come from lots of different places, speak many, many different languages. Yep. And it's nice to be able for you to have an outlet that sees that kind of range of, uh, of the community. Um, how about demographics though? Do you see more families, older people? Is it across the board? T talk a little bit about the people who are showing up each week. So it's, it's a mix. Uh, we serve, you know, we kind of look at our numbers weekly because people are coming to us weekly. So we serve somewhere around 2,400 families every week. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at like the whole year, you know, that number is duplicated. So somewhere around 6,000 families that see us at some point during the year. Um, it's definitely a mix of seniors and individuals and families with kids. Um, I think it's about 30% of our individuals that we serve are children. Um, mm -hmm. We work on a referral system, so everybody gets a referral from Department of Human Services sure. or folks with kids often come through the, the APS, public schools, okay. uh, right. with their referrals. So they're kind of doing that screening in the school, verifying if somebody's in need of food, they send them our way. Um, and then we also work, well, we have these distribution sites around town I mentioned, so um, which also really bring in that sense of community because we're co-locating a food pantry with a community center. People are already there. It's in their, it's on their turf. It's in their neighborhood. Is that like um, at Arlington Mill? Yeah. So Arlington okay. Mill, Gates of Boston, we're at a couple okay. APA and AHC properties, Wesley Housing. So, you know, it's already a community center that people are utilizing. And then at the same time, there's a food distribution there once a week. So I think it also kind of, you know, you start to see your neighbors more, you get to know your neighbors a little bit more because you're seeing them once a week. And it's also providing this service in a way that I think takes away a little bit of the stigma because it's it's there for right. the community. It's not like, oh, I'm going to get to the food pantry to get this just for me and I'm the only one. You're right. going there and, and it's the community there. Um, but five of those distribution sites that we have are actually senior apartments, um, low-income mm -hmm. senior apartments. So where basically we deliver all of the food to the community room or lobby area down on the first floor. The seniors can come downstairs, they pick up the groceries and they go back upstairs. So it's super easy for them. It's a community building uh, situation for them too. They get to see their neighbors. And I think that's one of the really hard things with the pandemic is that seniors in particular were so shut in. Um, you know, they, they were really restricting visitors coming into these buildings and, and having kind of communal, communal settings. Um, so, but we still, we kept up with our food distribution. Some places delivered door-to-door -door groceries. Um, and, and other ones, you know, we, we had to get really creative and some of them ended up outdoors. Um, right. oh, sure, sure. Is Gilliam Place one of the places that you distribute to? Gilliam is not one of ours at okay. this point, um, okay. but we have a couple, that's APA, I believe we have a couple of APA sites as well. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and what about interfacing with, um, there's a pantry, I think at Randolph Elementary and Queen of Peace has one. Is mm -hmm. there, I mean, is there kind of a loose knit organization of people who are doing this and you check in and make sure that there aren't any gaps or, you know, abundance over here, scarcity <laughs> over here, how can we address that? Yeah, I think we, you know, we do our best to communicate. We're always looking to, to communicate and work together um, on how we can serve our families. You know, AFAC, we've got all these pantry locations and our, our rule is, you know, you can come in and you can go to one of the pantries. So you can't go to every single one of them during the week because it's just once a week. Okay. Um, but there are other pantries that sometimes have other things. And so if a client goes to an AFAC pantry and then they also go to Our Lady Queen of Peace, you know, some people are kind of filling the gaps that way as well. Um, okay. But we wanna make sure that we're, like you said, we're not concentrating all our efforts on one neighborhood and then neglecting another. So we do our best to really kind of spread, um, spread access around so everybody can, can get what they need. And how about people who are homebound? 
um, they can't get out because they have a physical disability or they can't drive anymore or they had COVID, for example. So how would people be, be served uh, if they were meeting those conditions? Yeah, so that was the big new um, exciting thing was with the pandemic was we were like, oh my gosh, there's gonna be all these people who can't get to us um, and what do we do? And so, um, you know, we started in the county, we had this, this coalition for Hunger Free Arlington, a lot of partnerships were built that way and we started doing, um, uh, home deliveries with big help from the libraries and from um, right. you know, aging and disability through Department of Human Services. So we were working on identifying uh, families who were COVID positive and we're still making deliveries to those folks, you know, a year later, we're still doing it, um, but not quite as many. Sure. Um, so for the duration that that person is in quarantine or that their household is in quarantine, we're delivering groceries once a week to them. Okay. Um, and then we're also working with aging disability and a couple other op offices that work with people who might be homebound because they're immunocompromised. You know, right. they don't have COVID, but they just, they really can't leave or mm -hmm. they have a serious disability. So we've always had workarounds for people. So if you have a health care aid, you know, your health care aid can pick up food. If you have a friend or a neighbor, they can get your groceries for you. But we were realizing that some people didn't have that local support system. Um, you know, they didn't have somebody who could run that type of an errand. So we, uh, you know, with these other partners that we were working with, we stepped in and, and started making those deliveries. Okay. And I think it's somewhere around 400 families that we've delivered to over the year. Oh, um, and about a little more than half of them were COVID positive. Wow, that sounds like a lot. So, yeah. so um, Sarah Kate, tell me a little bit, please, about a, a day in the life of an AFAC volunteer. Like you, you get your coffee and you arrive there next to Jenny Dean Park in Sherlington, and then what happens? Well, I I, I think that first of all, I I do I do my my stretches in the morning because I'm getting ready prior to prior to AFAC uh, buying the warehouse next door. Right. I actually ran the outside miscellaneous. Oh no, kidding! Okay. And I was I was averaging anywhere between twelve and sixteen thousand steps and Gosh. working out. That's great. <laughs> That's great. So 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 realistically, Jeff and I, we try to get there by nine o'clock. Our shift doesn't start till nine thirty, but we want to get there and help set up and get our station. He does. He does the pasta and the canned goods, which is the very first section. He likes to get his stuff all organized. I run the miscellaneous now inside, so I want to get everything set up. And then generally, I like to help if they have extra bread or whatever needs to be helped. And then we get ready and somebody yells, Kim or Danielle yells, are you ready at 926? And we're like, yes. <laughs> and then it's rock and roll in until nearly uh, the other day, about 245, sometimes oh, wow. exactly at two o'clock. And then um, I think that Jeff and I decided that uh, what we saw when we first got there was that people just said, okay, we're done and, and left. And, and the workers, the employed workers would clean up. And we kind of said, you know, we can help with that too. I love mopping. Um, <laughs> it's not required, um, but you know, and, and so throughout the day, you know, we're talking with people coming through the line, the children coming through. Uh, I love that when we finally were able to bring out the little uh, uh, free library on its really wheels, I was able to bring all the books that I've been collecting to take back to Fiji and brought them in. And so you see the kids with their little book and their little cookie and their little mask. Um, so yeah, so throughout the time and then we're talking back and forth, people who are volunteering. Um, Jeff and I are very fortunate. We get to meet double the people. Uh, who are working the line because we work the morning and then the afternoon and okay. usually people are flipping mm -hmm. and uh usually by 2 30 we're walking out of there high-fiving each other and yelling to everybody saying we'll see you when we see you and uh, <laughs> oh that sounds that sounds like fun actually it's, it's an excellent and when I said to several people, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to volunteer for, you know, a full day or a couple days. You can just volunteer for a couple hours uh, once a week or maybe once a month uh, just to maybe get out, meet some people. Um, the other thing is that before, when we first started with AFAC, we actually were just 
bagging food and and all i mean that's still greatly needed sorting through the cans there's lots of stuff to do that you know you could just give a couple hours or come in and like jeff and i and and meet a whole new a whole new family well you should uh you should know that the county has volunteer hours county staff i'm county staff and we have a bank of hours i don't know it's four or eight or something like that, that we're supposed to use uh, as a means of giving back to the community. So this is something we could actually promote. If you want to start ticking off some of those hours, think about devoting some of that time to, uh, to a cause like AFAC. I do have friends who, oh, you know, regularly volunteer with, with AFAC and they talk about what a great experience it is. Mm -hmm. When I visited a couple of weeks ago, it looked like a very well-oiled machine. <laughs> like everybody had their task and it was moving along. And Charlie gave me a tour, Charlie Meng, who's your um, executive director. And I saw your space next door, which is <laughs> a pit at the moment. <laughs> but, um, but that's gonna be great to have that kind of additional space for the program. So. Mm -hmm. How can Arlingtonians get involved if they, if they watch this show? And of course, this is appointment TV for most of the community. <laughs> um, what what's it, what's an easy way for them to get involved? Are you looking for donations, volunteers, both? Is it more seasonal where you need some volunteers sometimes? How does that look? Tell me what your needs are and we can help promote them. Absolutely. Well, I want to I want to actually rewind a little bit because uh, I think what was really interesting this year is how our volunteers and our food donors and our monetary donors really stepped up with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we didn't close distribution and operations for a single day. We had to figure out how to handle, you know, incoming food donations. What do we do? Are they clean? Do we wipe them all down? Do we let them sit for a couple of days? You know, kind of trying to figure all of that out and what's safe. Um, and a lot of our volunteers, of course, uh, you know, the demographic is often retirees mm -hmm. and that was who was most at risk. Um, so a lot of our folks decided and rightfully so that they needed to stay home and, and, and protect themselves. Um, and then what, what happened was we had all these people who were like, I don't have work during the day. What can yeah. I do? We right. had an incredible force in Arlington of people who really stepped in and said, what, what do you need me to do? I will do it, whatever you need. And they came in and they, some of those folks were here, you know, like Sarah, Kate and Jeff, they were here multiple days out of the week, every day of the week. I mean, they were, it was like, we were a skeleton crew, but like we were, it was a tough crew and it was fun and it was a community. Right. Um, Right. And so I think, uh, you know, moving forward at this point, some of our, you know, from the great before, some of our volunteers are starting to come back. They're vaccinated now. They're, you know, it's, they're feeling more comfortable, um, and, which is terrific. And we love having them. But, but I think uh, volunteering is an absolutely great uh, thing that you can do. And we've got all sorts of activities, some where you're interfacing with clients, but we've got some that are, you know, a little bit more not around so many people for those folks who, you know, like I want to help, but I don't want to be around so many people. We've got that. We've got um, the library truck uh, visited a couple of weeks ago, and mm -hmm. I'm hoping we can do that, especially as again, more people get vaccinated and we're more comfortable about being out in the community. Um, make that uh, a mobile that connects a lot of the community in more unusual ways. I mean, I assume that not everyone goes to the library, but the library is there for everyone. So the truck is a way for us to promote the kinds of services that we have. Um, in terms of Can special, I, go ahead, of I course. A, a, yes. To what Lily said, the other thing that's coming up very soon is that um, our JK Farms that donates all their food we're they're actually may 22nd we're having uh the first planning and then for the next couple months if people love to be outdoors if they want to pick or plant or they just want to get out and, and meet some people i mean that's another way for people to volunteer uh going out and gleaming picking peppers 
uh, bringing your children out to, to learn about what, what gets grown in plants and all. Uh, JK uh, Farms has a, a beehive, three, oh, four wow. beehives. Oh, wow, no kidding. Okay. It was a great place for families to bring their kids and learn. Where is JK Farms, please? Lily? I actually don't remember. It's a little further out. Um, out there. Over in Virginia. <laughs> um, but we do this farm gleaning. Um, uh, you know, over, over the years, we've done it at a handful of different farms. And JK came out a couple of years ago with this new program. And it's been terrific. We get so much produce from them. And it's now how about mm -hmm. leftovers from a farmer's market, for example, on a Saturday? Is that an opportunity for you all to collect? Yep, we do that too. We've done that for years where we send volunteers out and the farmers will, you know, they don't necessarily want to take back all this produce back to their farm at the end of this, you know, the weekend when they're done selling it. And so they donate it to us and they get a, you know, tax incentive too, because they're giving this produce to us that would otherwise be sellable. Um, right. And it's a really beautiful way to get this fresh, local, delicious, organic, seasonal produce to our families who are coming to us. Do we also reach out to the people who participate in community gardens? Um, I think there's there's one on Barton that I know that I used to pass by pretty frequently. Is that also an option or? Yeah, do you so actually... there's, okay. so community gardens, if you have a plot in a community garden and you, and you grow a huge amount of cucumbers, you can bring your leftovers to us um, or grow an extra plot of, you know, extra row for us. Um, okay. A lot of gardens at churches, at schools, just kind of at community centers, you know, they'll donate um, or even your own personal garden at home in your backyard. Right. Um, and of course, there's the Central Library Garden. Yes. That has been uh, operating, so to speak, since I think like 2009. Yeah. Uh, it's been there a long time. Pu and Lee had a huge role in getting that started and it's still going. And we've added... Um, garden talks over the years and nice. uh, events around bees and ladybugs. There was a ladybug thing that we did one time. So, um, but it's still going strong. And it was just a kind of a negligible patch of grass in front of Central Library that's we've turned into something that can be of benefit to the community. So nice. as, we, as we wind down, what, what kind of special thing happened over the last year that really reminded each of you, wow, this is why I'm doing this work. Was there a story, a person, um, uh, an event, a moment with one of your clients, I a mean, high five moment, something? <laughs> I think it was really just incredible to see how everybody came together in mm -hmm. so many ways. They're like, okay, we need to get food to people who are not working. We need to, you know, assist with transportation. We need to, um, you know, help people who are homebound. Um, you know, there's volunteer organizations that kind of, you know, popped up or expanded to basically, you know, help with essential errands for people who are homebound, um, including AFAC, but other things too. Um, you know, the way that, you know, I think all these organizations really stepped in and stepped up to say, we have to support our people in our community. This is our mm -hmm. town. This is these are our people. Mm -hmm. um, that was really beautiful to see. And how about you, Sarah Kate? I would say that first of all, I'm a I'm a really take charge kind of person, and a fact besides welcoming Jeff and I into that family, they allowed me to make suggestions and changes with. And, and listened, listened to some of my suggestions and act upon them, which real, I found initially very surprising because again, being overseas in, in emerging countries, you have to get through all of that to hopefully make a shift with people. Sure. And, uh, and, and just the community. I mean, Jeff and I were really feeling very at lost, um, couldn't go see anybody. We really did not have our heads wrapped around that. I remember mm -hmm. flying in from Fiji going, oh, well, this is going to be a great time to see your parents and we'll see so-and-so. Wow, did we not know? <laughs> exactly. And, but when we got there, it was just amazing to be part of that family and to watch everybody step up, our, 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 customer, our clients and us all working together and realizing we are in this together. And we, we, we did, I mean, yeah, it's been a year and we're still having fun. And, um, I would love to see other, and, and like Lily said, we're starting to see our older 
uh, volunteers come back. I just met five different people who had been before the uh, uh, pandemic. So that was really nice. So it, it all very positive. I could have just come back and been so depressed. Um, instead, I have this new family of friends and, and all. So yeah. Well, that's beautifully said. Um, it really does. You've created a family there. And uh, I think that's one of the lessons from the pandemic is that we can't do any of this alone. We need family, whether it's our family of origin or the families we create for ourselves or the families in the community. Uh, you guys are clearly uh, motivators and builders of community. And um, we all thank you and appreciate the work that you're doing. And would like to support you in any way that we can through the library or through reaching out to our cadre of volunteers to remind them of extra volunteer opportunities. Um, it, makes, it makes the community go. And uh, that's an important uh, lesson in all of these conversations that we're, that we're trying to have. So I thank you both for uh, spending time with me this afternoon and demystifying AFAC and uh, helping me shine a light on truly a very critical community program. It will air sometime soon. You can be you know, free to push the link out to the thousands of people who follow you on Instagram and Facebook and all that. But, uh, but again, thank you for important work and I will show up soon to be a volunteer. Yes, and please. I'll, and bring that bookmobile fun. back anytime. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thank you both. And we'll talk so soon. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.